I'm so happy to be here, um, <laughs> to be heard. Um, so, so thanks, Sunil, for a, a very nice introduction. And thank you all for coming. I wanted to spend just um, 30 or 40 seconds, maybe 50 seconds, uh, explaining to you all um, who haven't heard this a hundred times um, what this To Think To Write To Publish program is. It's a program uh, uh, supported by uh, the National Science Foundation. It's an 18 month long program. And the whole idea is to bring together um, next generation creative nonfiction, narrative nonfiction writers, people with a great deal of interest in narrative nonfiction at the kind of the beginning of their careers um, and bring them together with um, next generation um, science policy scholars, people who have a great deal of dedication and uh, to, to the way in which the world is going to be shaped uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and 20 years hence and uh, t and something that Arizona State and uh, the, the academic, academic center I'm with the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes field is very important and um, and but we also think that it's really important for people interested in science technology and science policy to open up their world to the general public and the way in which you do open up your world to the general public these days, well, throughout the history of man, is through story, through narrative, through telling tales, through capturing character, um, and and so this this is the this is this is the mission and the objective of of to think to write to publish, and um, and and this is uh, was the grant is the grant that the National Science Foundation has supported. We got more than 400, or sorry, more than 200 applications from people, policy scholars, and and narrative nonfiction writers from all across the world. We selected 24, 12 uh, writers and 12 scholars, and they have been they've come together here for four intense days to kind of not only learn together about narrative, but also learn together about policy and um, and then begin to plan a collaborative non creative nonfiction narrative nonfiction essay about science and science policy. So we're breaking some interesting barriers and doing something new on many different levels. So that's why we're all here. And um, uh, just for a second, um, I'm the, the PI on this grant, but my co-PI is the director of the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes at Arizona State. His name is David Gustin, and he's somewhere there waving at you now. So, um, so we, we fashioned this program together. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, let, this is kind of the final event of this, of this um, first part of this grant and this workshop. And I want to introduce to you the people who are here. Um, and and um, we went through a pitch slam this afternoon. And so our 12 collaborators presented their article essay ideas to these editors. And they were terrific. And not only were they terrific, but the editors gave many um, terrific, um, um, very helpful bits of advice and great feedback to to our, our to our uh, collaborative teams, and they will in fact be helping you in, in many different ways. So each editor you'll meet tonight will talk to you for eight or ten minutes about their publication, their interest in science, technology, technology and policy, and then we'll have a little conversation about that. And then um, these are really nice people. Editors can be nice, and um, these are really nice people. So we're going to go out and eat some cheese and drink some wine, and I encourage you to uh, go and talk with them. Um, earlier today, we met Virginia Morrell, and Virginia is sitting to my right, and she'll be participating in the Q&A, but Virginia is a freelance writer. She has written for all the best publications in the world, including National Geographic and Science, and um, has been honored uh, one of her books was uh, one of the New York Times Best Notable Books of the Year, and her new book is, which will be out in February, and which is open now for pre-order on Amazon while you're sitting there with your phone, um, 
animal-wise, the thoughts and emotions of our fellow creatures. Crown will be publishing that early next year, Virginia Morrell. And I'm just going to go down the line and introduce um, uh, the editors that we're talking to you, and then we'll go in order um, of, of um, kind of last on the table will be first. And that last person is um, certainly la not last in prestige and importance, um, Scott Stossel. He's the new editor of the Atlantic Magazine, and he's also um, an award-winning author. Uh, his most recent book is, uh, is entitled Sarge, The Life and Times of Sergeant Shriver. Uh, and the Boston Globe uh, called it, quote, um, um, an extraordinary achievement. And it has been praised by Publishers Weekly and lots of other publications around the United States. And, I mean, it's really terrific to have the editor of The Atlantic um, here with us tonight, so that's really, uh, that's great. And um, uh, Christopher Cox is sitting beside Scott. And um, um, how much just as good to have the senior editor of Harper's Magazine with us. Um, and that's Christopher Cox. Um, so he edits the magazine features, and um, he was um, he kind of crosses genres because he was with the Paris Review um, before before being with Harper's uh, as the fiction editor. So it's really terrific uh, to to have him here as well. I mean, how much better can you do than the Atlantic um, and uh, and Harper's Magazine? And then of course there's National Geographic, and we can't we can't we we. I mean, it's kind of what a great, what a great combination, and um, and that's for Victoria Pope, and uh, she's the deputy editor of National Geographic magazine, and uh, the chief editor for Text, and um, um, she was the executive editor prior to being with National Geographic at U.S. News and World Report, um, and Laura Helmut um, is the science and health editor for Slate magazine. And for eight years, Laura was um, the senior editor at Smithsonian Magazine, and also, I should say, a longtime supporter of, um, of, of um, this idea, this to think, to write, to publish idea, um, and has participated in, with us at ANA and ASU for the past few years. So those are the four magazine people. And Mark Rotella is a rather interesting fellow. Um, <laughs> I should say that. Um, that I will only say that he's a former dancer, which I only just learned uh, not only an hour or so ago, and um, and I have seen him dance, and so I'm not surprised. And maybe you'll see him dance tonight too. I'm not sure, but um, he um, he's he's the author of Amor, Amor, Amore, 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 um, the story of Italian American song and stolen figs and. Um, Stolen Figs and Other Adventures in Calabria. And um, he's also, from a magazine pointer, uh, point of view, the senior editor at uh, Publishers Weekly. And uh, it's really important to know a senior editor of Publishers <laughs> Weekly. So, um, so and, and he's, as I say, he dances well. So writing and dancing well, there's nothing better, no better combination than that. So Mark will talk with us last and speak about the book world, but now we're going to kind of begin um, with Scott Stossel from The Atlantic. Should I stay here? Or go? I think you should go up there. We know this microphone. <laughs> Well, thank you. thank you all for coming. Thank you, Lee, for that very uh, kind and generous introduction. Uh, I can only let you down. I mean, I, yes, I, it's true, I do work for The Atlantic, which is a 155-year-old publication, very august. And um, I, I think the reputation of the magazine and its great tradition always precedes me. And I show up and I'm just like the schmuck who works there. And I can't po po possibly um, uh, live up to the, uh, the reputation of the institution. Um, but I wanted to talk I water down. Uh, for, for a couple minutes about um, what what the Atlantic uh, is looking for in general, and in particular what we're looking for, what we're looking for uh, writing about science. Um, the challenge, and it's a challenge that I think many of us uh, on this panel share. You know, if I were the editor uh, of Cat Fancy magazine, um, or Guitar Player magazine, or Surfboard magazine, the job I think in some ways would be um, a lot easier because you're the terrain that you're covering is a lot more narrow. You're looking for articles about cats or 
surfboards or um, cats on surfboards. Um, whereas, uh, you know, the Atlantic and Slate and National Geographic uh, and Harper's all cover uh, the universe. Um, and so anything is fair game, um, which is incredibly exciting um, and, and challenging and, and makes it fun to go to work every day, but also makes it very difficult because, you know, what are the parameters that limit um, what we publish? How do we decide? Um, what are the guiding principles uh, that, that dictate what we should or shouldn't be assigning or, or, or publishing? Um, and, I, and I always, this is always kind of a cop out, but I always find myself uh, defaulting to the famous, um, you know, people ask me, what, what, what is an Atlantic article? Um, you know, what makes for, for, for the article that you're looking for? And I, I default to the uh, famous Potter Stewart definition of, of pornography in the Supreme Court, which is you kind of know it when you see it. Um, that, that is a cop out, so, I, so I'll try to, try to explain some of the properties uh, of, a, of the stories that, that we're looking for. I mean, we're, we're always looking, um, uh, and, and, and have been since the founding of the magazine, uh, articles about ideas. Um, we've done that often through, through fiction. Um, in our early years, we, we serialized the novels of Henry James, um, published fiction by Mark Twain, uh, nonfiction by, by Virginia Woolf. Uh, and, and fiction um, is, is obviously um, a mode of storytelling, but it's also a way of, of helping to explain, to explain the world. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at you know, con contemporary matters, uh, and, and we still publish fiction, but, you know, what, what are the kind of uh, basic properties that, that we're looking for in an Atlantic article? And it, it, it varies from article to article, um, but I'd say a, a few of them are, you know, we really, as I say, are a magazine of ideas. So you're looking for the, what we like to call um, the, either the, 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 the gee whiz idea, the idea that, um, you know, when, when you read it, uh, it you, you, you sit down, or you know, the, the, and if you're part of my French, it's, it's the, the alternative way of putting the, the Jew as it is, it's the holy shit moment where you, you read it and you think, holy shit, you know, this is something new and, 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 and interesting and makes me think about uh, an important issue uh, in, in a new way. Um, we're also, you know, we, we aspire, as I think all of us do, to, to in some ways inflect and drive um, the important national conversations, particularly about public policy, but about culture and society. Um, so there's a little bit of a knack, and, and you know, we have a different challenge than, say, Slate, um, or even a weekly magazine like The New Yorker. The New Yorker is terrific uh, in, the, in the front of the book. Their comment is like, can, they have such fantastic writers, they can always just look and see, well, what happened last week? Here's what happened last week. We have these terrific thinkers and writers. We'll just respond and write to it. We can do that online. But in our print magazine, where we're planning often, you know, at, at the very least, six weeks to, to, to eight weeks ahead and often six months to a year ahead, we're kind of having to see around corners and trying to, you know, figure out the magical alchemy of, you know, what are the trends and news stories uh, and, and things that are developing now, but then trying to see, play out how are they going to develop over the next one month, two months, three months, four months, and then find the writer and it really is kind of an alchemy of finding them with the marriage of idea and, 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 and writer who, who, who can really take that idea. And, and, and often it's an idea that you know, everyone is already thinking and, and, and writing about and you feel like you know everything you need to know about that topic. How do you draw in the reader from the very first sentence, from the first paragraph, from the way you display it on the page and keep them reading along? We were talking earlier this afternoon about, uh, you know, for instance, um, Climate change, huge issue. Whatever side of the um, climate change debate you sit on, um, it's in the news all the time. It's potentially, you know, ha has the, the, the potential to change everything about the way we live now and the way we'll live in the future. But you also feel like you've read, you know, five million stories about this. So, uh, as magazine editors, our challenge is to is to figure out, you know, how do we take this subject and 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 make it new. So. In, in, in thinking specifically about you know articles on, on science and and science policy, um, in, in some ways you know we, we see ourselves as uh, like a midwife between um, or, or, or or I've heard people throw the term around um, intellectual arbitrage. Um, I don't exactly know what that means, but it sounds really cool, um, and it has something to do with you know taking ideas from the academy um, where you've got experts who you know know deeply about them and, and 
um, can you know, explain them in, in um, sometimes excruciating detail. Uh, and how do you translate that for a general audience uh, in a way that uh, captures their attention um, but without doing uh, uh, violence or, or distorting or oversimplifying uh, the complexity of, of, of the issues involved. And you know, as Lee has spent a, a, a career exploring, you know, the, the, the easiest way and the, and the most effective way to do this is by a narrative. So um, you know, we were joking earlier that um, you know, the, the, the worst thing, um, and there are exceptions to everything, I mean, something we will publish, raw science and raw data, because the idea that the, the data and the science are so compelling that even a general reader will look at it and say, have that gee whiz moment and, and, and grok kind of what we're, we're trying to convey. But for the most part, the more we can envelop um, these scientific stories, and, and, from, and whether that's from the social sciences, the hard sciences, biological sciences, physical sciences, um, the more we can envelop that in a, in a narrative, um, the more effective we will be at sort of providing the, the, you know, the spoons full of sugar to help the medicine go down. Um, and, uh, and, and, and narrative is obviously, you know, what is narrative? Well, it's, it's storytelling in its basic, um, sort of most rudimentary element, and there's a human, um, um, uh, almost you know, evolutionarily rooted desire or, or, or compulsion to, 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 you know, we're drawn to stories. So, you know, if you can impose a plot, a, a story on your, on your um, you know, scientific information, if you can bring to, 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 to bear really interesting characters, you know, who's the scientist who's doing these studies, who are the people who are affected uh, by the science um, that, that is contained in these studies, um, what are the stakes, you know, at the Atlantic, again, we're very interested in ideas, the clash of ideas, and, and we are, we are um, have no ideological predispositions. Um, so oftentimes you can, can uh, extract you know, real interesting, exciting drama from the, from the play of ideas. Th these are incredibly difficult stories to write because you need to be able to um, have the expertise and the knowledge to do justice to the science itself and at the same time be skillful at playing ideas off each other, at modulating tone, at, at uh, you know, generating narrative momentum so that the reader is carried along, even sometimes through the thickets uh, of sometimes very technical information. Um, you know, my job as editor is often to be, um, and this is not a hard stretch for me, but to kind of be the designated idiot. Um, you know, I, I, I will ask the stupid, obvious questions. You know, I, I uh, am very interested in science. I've read a lot about science, but I have no formal scientific training. So if I don't understand it, I'm, but I'm very curious and I'm, and I'm interested in a lot of things. So when writers submit stuff to us, if I'm confused, um, I, you know, I, I have to sort of overcome my embarrassment about asking uh, the really simple, rudimentary question, like, what do you mean by this? Or I don't understand uh, that. And you know, often it, 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 it's simply a matter of imposing a certain amount of clarity, translating things out of the jargon, and translate, you know, and, and um, enveloping them, wrapping them up in, in a good uh, narrative story. Um, I, I, can, I can give you one, um, by way of conclusion, um, example, a real world example. We have, we have a piece that'll be coming up in our November issue. We just closed our November issue. Um, uh, nobody steal this idea and run it, run it before us. <laughs> Um, but with pieces, the, 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 the world of synthetic biology um, and sort of genomic exploration, where, where um, uh, you know you can now you know, they've effectively, convert, effectively convert the genome into um, stuff that you can manipulate on a computer, in ones and zeros. Uh, and so, so we have, we have a, a, a collection of actually three writers who have expertise in three different areas. One of them is sort of a criminologist. One of them is a molecular biologist. And one of them is, is sort of the writer that they hired to try to translate their science um, into layman's terms. And the, the, the piece is really about um, both the promises and perils of synthetic biology. And that as we, you know, Moore's, people hear about Moore's Law, which they apply to um, you know, exponential advances in the power of uh, microprocessor chips to um, process stuff for computers. Well, that same um, Moore's Law phenomenon has been uh, in place, except even more so in our ability to manipulate the human genome or, or to, to understand the human genome. Um, so the, these writers, what they set out to do is, is, is talk about, well, wh wh what are the actual dangers posed by this by bioterrorists? 
Um, now, that's actually not their primary concern in their daily lives. Um, but what they used, the, they, 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 they settled upon this as a very interesting way of telling the story about um, you know, how rapidly has synthetic biology been, been advancing? Um, what are the, what are the uh, poten potential, what, what's the potential that it has to uh, uh, apply itself to personal genomics, personalized medicine, that kind of thing? But they've, they've sort of turned it, uh, the, the way we tell the story is it's almost a kind of a science fiction narrative. Uh, what would happen if somebody, in fact, hacked the president's DNA? They, they picked up a glass that he uh, used when he went out to dinner at Five Guys, as he sometimes does when he ventures out into, into Washington. Um, they took that DNA, um, it, it figured out his entire genome, using that information, uh, figured out what viruses and, and, and particular diseases he might be susceptible to, crowdsourced uh, or, 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 or sort of used the, the array of um, synthetic biology and, and just biohacking um, uh, technology that, that's increasingly built, increasingly available today for lower and lower prices. And so the scenario they paint is, you know, that the president goes to give a speech at Harvard in, say, 2015 or 2016. Uh, a woman goes to shake his hand and coughs on him and infects him with a disease that is untraceable um, because nobody knows where it came from. And it could do anything from kill him to, um, uh, and this is still a little bit in the realm of science fiction, um, start to introduce rapid onset dementia. Um, again, it's a fanciful, um, um, somewhat science fiction story, but it is all based in real science. And, so, and the idea here is to kind of grab the readers by the lapels, almost with a thriller-like um, uh, intensity. Uh, but it's an incredibly effective way of, of telling the story of the advances in synthetic biology, the advances in um, understanding and, and manipulating the human genome. Uh, so I guess I will stop there. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Christopher Cox, and I am at Harper's Magazine, uh, where I work on the features. And uh, it's actually very useful to go to Scott because uh, he basically covered everything that I could want to cover. Um, <laughs> But uh, Harper's and, and the Atlantic are pretty similar. We, we are both, as Scott said, um, are basically covering the universe. And uh, it's our job as editors to figure out um, how to make articles that work for our audience and for the magazine out of that broad, broad field. But um, maybe first I'll um, draw a few distinctions between what Scott said and what, and what we're looking for, particularly at Harper's. Um, and. Um, well, first, I can point out that uh, we're 162 years old. Um, <laughs> seven years older than the Atlantic. Um, and the, for us, I would say that the balance shifts to some extent away from ideas and towards story. Um, I mean, it, it's not a mistake that uh, I came from the Paris Review as a fiction editor and then was hired to do this nonfiction job at Harper's because um, for us, we're interested in good stories first and then the subject matter second. Um, of course, we want both to be as strong as possible, um, but, um, you know, we, we are not the magazine of record, we're not the New York, we're also not the New York Times. We have no obligation to cover any particular uh, subject in science, so the reason that we're going to cover it is if the subject is important and the author has found a way to make it um, a compelling narrative and marry it to scenes that place the reader right there um, and are as immediate as any other um, story you might be told in the magazine. Um, in fact, uh, as, as I was thinking about this, this sort of this idea versus narrative balance, um, I thought about some of my favorite Harper's pieces. Um, and they have like really dumb ideas behind them. Um, like perhaps the most famous Harper's piece of the last 20 years is David Foster Wallace going uh, on a cruise ship for a few weeks. And that pitch, I'm pretty sure, was just David Wallace saying, I want to go on a cruise ship. Um, and it's a great piece. And the same is true of Barbara Ehrenreich. She wrote this piece called Nickel and Dimed. Um, the pitch for that was, I want to live at minimum wage for a month. Um, and yet, 
because of the narrative, because of also the skill of the writer, you know, they became pieces that not just were very readable, but told us something very new, interesting, and insightful about American society. So that's sort of where we uh, come at science from. And um, I would say that if you, if you think about um, approaching Harper's with a science piece, um, there are a couple ways to sort of navigate your way through uh, all of the raw data and the raw science in order to make it uh, something that would work for us in a narrative sense. Um, one thing I end up t telling writers a lot, this actually came up during the um, pitch slam, was to, is to find your Virgil, to sort of find a character who can lead you through this material. Um, actually, not at Harper's, but at the New Yorker for most of his career, John McPhee is an expert at this. He always finds some expert who can talk in a very articulate way about their field and take them through all the intricacies of it. Because if it was just McPhee talking out of his own mouth about geology for 10,000 words, you, you couldn't read it. Um, so there's that. There's also this idea of um, what Hitchcock called the MacGuffin, um, which uh, maybe the most famous one is um, Rosebud in Citizen Kane. Um, the stated purpose of that movie is we're going to find out what Rosebud means. And we do find out what Rosebud means, but that's actually not what the movie's about. The movie's about this person's life, and that's only the excuse to take us through this narrative. Um, so if you can find your rosebud uh, for your science piece, like whatever it is, whatever the immediate mission is that keeps the narrative uh, propulsion going in order to get at the subject you're most interested in writing about, that's what you need to look for. Um, speaking more generally, um, you know, Harper's publishes pieces that are crusades against conventional wisdom in the science realm. So one example from recently is we published a long piece last February about fasting. Um, and uh, the author came to us with all this information, all this data about the effect of fasting on health. Um, and specifically he wanted to talk about um, the effect of fasting on patients recovering from cancer. Uh, from cancer treatment. Um, the idea being that if you fast before going through chemotherapy, you have much better outcomes. And uh, we said, fine, that's a very interesting subject. Um, I haven't read all that much about it. But in order to make it Harvard's piece rather than a piece in another magazine, um, what we settled on, this wasn't the only solution, but the solution we found was to have him do it. So he fasted for 30 days, and all sorts of amazing things happened to him. Um, it's a good piece if you haven't read it. Um, so that's one way, one way to get at it. Uh, we do a lot of personal history pieces, um, pieces about surviving illness. Uh, also, uh, we have most of our pieces, um, we have a lot of political coverage in the magazine, so environmental journalism comes in quite a lot. Um, and then occasionally we have uh, just the sort of, you know, gee whiz kind of story. Um, last year I worked on a piece of Alan Lightman about cosmology, and um, I worked really hard to try and sneak a couple scenes in there, because uh, that's what we want. We want narrative, we want scenes, and Alan wrote a few scenes, but mainly it's just about general ideas and cosmology. So like, if, if the science is cool enough, then it's sort of like the raw data dump, yes, we can take it, because uh, some ideas just stand up on their own. Um, but anyway, I guess I'll leave it there. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to answer questions, of course. So I never thought of National Geographic as an upstart organization, but uh, it's only shy of its 125th year. So. <laughs> um, I've been the uh, editor there, uh, handling the words in the magazine for seven years. It, it is a unique experience, different from any other place I've worked. And that, of course, is because of, of the visuals, which are so important to everything we do. Uh, we know science is, is our most popular subject, broadly speaking. Science, we have for probably 50 years done surveys with readers, so we know very well what does well in the minds of subscribers, anyway. 
And though we have this tremendous need to do science, we're also very, it's always challenging for us, very challenging for the science editor, Jamie Shreve, who follows trends, and then we have to say, okay, this is a great story, how do we illustrate it? So then you end up with a little bit of a strange situation because rather than having, uh, you can often be, you'll be, let's say, doing a story on baby brains because babies are photogenic rather than doing something on neuro, some other aspect of neuroscience. And so we try very hard to not, not let this cramp what we do and to try to have coverage that covers all the meaningful subjects. We do indeed, I, I suppose, actually, every issue has something about, about evolution in it. You don't write about animals and plants and, and these sorts of things without talking about the hand of evolution. And we do, do write about climate change quite a lot and, and find a way to do it. There's a wonderful photographer named Baylock who has been charting the actual receding of the Antarctic. And, um, and he, um, he, he's been doing this for 10 years, actually, thanks to some grants from National Geographic. But the biggest, I will say that we have to look at things as the glass is always half full rather than half empty. Our readers are, generally speaking, you can say they're, they're much more average than, than several of the publications anyway that are here. They're six million in the United States. Um, they, the marketers like to say they're 20, 25,000. 25 million readers around the world. So, you know, that's a lot of people reading it. And we, um, we have to talk a lot about what, what is the wonder of this story. We have to flip a lot, of, a lot of serious subjects onto either solutions or, or just the magnificence of some event. And this can be very frustrating in a way. We all, you know, journalists love to be pessimistic and look at dire situations, and I feel thwarted a lot of the time, actually, because I can't do this as much as I like, but I know that the re for the readers, you have to bring them in through their door, and then they go out your door, and that's what we try to do with a lot of these very serious topics. Um, uh, we had a, a very classic narrative in the, in the magazine recently on, on um, blood ivory, as we called it. Did any of you read that story? One. Oh, no. Well, um, the story was actually, oh yeah, there you go. Um, what was interesting about that story in terms of what this weekend of talk about writing and science has been, that it was an investigative piece that looked into the use of, of ivory for religious articles. It exposed the fact that many of the articles that are said to be old are really not old. It talked about China's role in the illegal market and it talked about policy. And there was a whole long section about um, what CITES, which is the big controlling international agency for wildlife, uh, hasn't done, and some of the ways in which it has become mired in its own politics. And uh, you know, I have to be honest about this. I read the section about CITES the first time, and I said to the editor, because it's a very long piece for us, it was more than, when it came in, it was 10,000 words. And I said, just boil this, you know, typical editor, just boil this all down to, you know, a paragraph. And, and Olive Payne, who's, who's um, a great editor and, and very, um, he has very strong views on things, he came back and said, I, I know why you're saying that, it's really, really confusing, but just let us work it out. And so, indeed, over three or four drafts, we ended up keeping a very important section of the, of the story there, but that is one of the most difficult things to do in a, in a story for a general readership, to actually have a deep look at policies that have had an effect on a, on a subject, because we, we're, we worry very much about people's eyes glazing over. Uh, in this case, I think if you read the story, you'll see that it was quite animated, but it took an awful lot of writing work to make it that way. Um, when you talk about narrative. I have to say that for me, uh, of course, we want narrative writing, and I, um, it's been my goal the whole time we've, I've been at the Geographic to try to make the narrative writing better. But I think especially in science writing, where you're sometimes not left with a lot of good 
uh, subject matter, but you have, I mean, p characters and people that you, you can tell an awfully good story just by having a strong voice, which is not to say it's not narrative, but what you really notice is, is the voice. Uh, I don't think you should make the mistake, as Geographic did for many years, of sending someone in the field and then thinking that all facts are equal, whatever they experienced is interesting, and you run out this long, long piece about being in, in the rainforest, but, you know, it's not, it, it, you're, you're, you're bored by it. And I think, um, you know, one story that I really thought was, was uh, Right this way was we sent Olivia Judson to Mount Erebus in Antarctica, and she um, you know, she had a classic what we would have a classic exploration story where she went someplace, they sat around, they took some samples of this and that, and they came back. And what she did is turned, and, and many 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 writers when faced with this situation really try to press the heroic button and, and speak in very heroic terms about what's going on and. And, you know, I can get very excited about heroic-sounding people, but what she did is show all the plain and ordinary things about it, all the, um, how you, how you, uh, you know, how you pee, how you, how you get dressed, and she, she just showed the ordinary, ordinary details of it, and it was very, very funny, very cunning story, and it was very readable, whereas, you know, there were an awful lot of other stories that I get in that vein that I, I resort to cutting because I don't find that it, it holds up all that well. Another thing about the geographic is that we, because we have this, this uh, visual mandate, we don't tend to have a situation where you come to me with a proposal and, and it's got a very, a very angled approach, and I say, okay, let's do with that, that story. That sounds very cool. We have to talk to the, to the visual side at the same time. And their tendency is to want to take a focus story and make it broader, because they want a larger canvas to work from. So this is always the fight. And when I first got to the geographic, um, it was such a fight that the writer would write about maybe even from one place and, you know, one angle and then the photographer would go to another country and have a completely different, you know, <laughs> narrative. Um, and we'd say, that's okay, there can be two separate narratives, they complement each other. Well, this is really bullshit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have changed that. My other great feeling of, as an aside, my other great uh, feeling of success there was that for some reason, the phot photography side never liked to show a picture of anyone who was in a story, right? Right? <laughs> and it used to drive me crazy because people like, if they're reading about a character and they, and they want to see the person, and of course we want it to be a great photograph, and um, it's still very hard to do, but we, we broke through. Um, the first time we did it, we had to get Martin Scholler to do the photography. He's a great, you know, portrait photographer, and that made them feel they're doing something good with this. Now we actually have cases of just the photographer taking the picture of a person in the story, and nobody complains about it. So, um, time up? Okay. 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 Well, uh, maybe forget. Um, what else can I say? No, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> All right, so uh, I have a very kind of different audience. They may be the same people, but they read Slate stories at a different point in their lives than they read The Atlantic or National Geographic or Harper's. But uh, no, not that. I mean, I read, I read everything um, represented on this panel. And, Basically, people read Slate, so Slate Magazine's online magazine was the first online magazine, so that makes us old in web time, but very young, obviously, compared to magazine time. Uh, but it is a magazine, it's um, basically, we think that our audience is people who are at work goofing off, <laughs> so procrastinating during the day, because you've got your monitor there, you really should be looking at that spreadsheet, but it was just to go to sleep and see what's going on in the world. So. Um, you know, we, we don't expect our readers to be looking for science necessarily, um, and we don't expect them to have a lot of time or a, you know, a great attention span. They may have to click away if their boss walks by. Uh, so it's uh, so we have kind of different 
use, we have different ways of using narrative. And um, so, but you know, the main point to take away is that um, a narrative isn't just something that you do with a classic 5,000 word magazine story. You can also write narrative in short stories. Um, and you know, the rules apply in the same way. You want to have something snappy, surprising, you want action, you want characters, you want scenes. And of course you can't do that in a thousand word, you know, just quick web story always, but um, you can use a lot of the same tools. And uh, when you are working for an online audience, you can also use additional tools, not just text, but you can tell your stories with quizzes and animated GIFs to make people laugh, and you can uh, you know, use obviously video and, and photo galleries and things like that. So you want to be sort of thinking narratively um, in multiple dimensions. You don't, it, it doesn't have to just be text, although that is the, you know, usually the, kind of the most mature technology for telling narratives so far. Um, and also for, for those of you who are writers and are working on these big projects um, for the next year or ten months, is that how long will be collaborating? Yeah, so um, obviously you want to have big things as your ultimate goal, but you also throughout the process you want to be peeling off stories that stand alone, that uh, can be in slate, that don't need to that don't need a six month lead time, that don't need five thousand, ten thousand words, but that you could tell a part of. And so, the, and that's kind of the one of the tricks of being a successful writer is always, you know, finding multiple ways to tell your story for multiple audiences at multiple lengths, and you know, kind of pluck off different pieces of it there that can still be coherent. Um, so, slate, you know, most <clears throat> most of what we do is politics and culture, and so, you know, like like most of the other magazines here, we don't uh, we don't think that people go to us specifically looking for science, and in fact. Most of our readers who do click on a science story came looking for something else. So there's kind of this process of luring or tricking people who think they're scared of science into reading something. And really, narrative is the best way to do that, to start with an interesting character or scene uh, and kind of you know, get them to read about it. And only at the end, if maybe never, they realize, oh my gosh, I just learned something about cosmology. Um, you know, some people like to do that, but others you have to be kind of brought in whether they like it or not. And so um, when, you're, when you're trying to think of where you want to place the story, um, you want to think, okay, what is this about besides science? And especially with science policy stories, what is it about you know, besides scientific research and besides politics and besides you know, the, the tedious process of getting legislation passed? And so if a story that you're working on has anything to do with food or with um, culture or you know, politicians doing something ridiculously stupid, um, there's all these kind of angles that you can basically say, okay, this is a story about what would actually, um, Victoria brought up a nice example from, from Slate today, this is a story about how to crack an egg. It's a story about cooking and baking and pop culture, but it's really about physics once you get through it. So you always want to kind of think uh, you know, about your stories not just as science, but about science plus whatever you can bring in. Um, and then as far as, uh, so for Slate, we tend to, our stories tend to be shorter, um, they don't have to be. Uh, they tend to be very opinionated. Um, almost always. We do some straight stories, but it really helps if there's a twist. And uh, when I was um, in graduate school, I was trying to decide whether to go into science or go into writing. I took a class um, with Molly Ivins. She was a visiting scholar at Berkeley first semester. Wonderful. So, of course, that made the decision for me. But uh, she had a class on um, column writing. And the best bit of advice I thought that she gave was, okay, you're writing a column. You know, Say you've got a gig in a newspaper. You have to write something two or three times a week. And you know you, you go around going, what should I write about next? What should I write about next? And she said, what you want to write about is whatever makes you mad or whatever makes you laugh. And that's definitely the case at Slate. So our stories are basically either this is really funny or this will make you mad. And uh, it's very effective. People like you know obviously like to laugh, but they also like to know okay what is the outrage of the week? We when we do we do Olympics coverage. Um, and I could care less about the Olympics, but the best part for me about it is we have sports jerk of the week, or you know, the Olympics jerk, you know, who's, the, who's the biggest jerk of the Olympics? And it's, it's really, it's a contested field. It's, it's hard to pick, there's so many to choose from. But, um, so anyhow, things, things that make you angry. Um, and, and often, you can be angry on behalf of science. So, you know, creationists getting in the way, you know, trying to prevent science education um, you know, in Louisiana from teaching evolution in schools. You know, that's something you can really get riled up about. And um, it so happens that we had a story in Slate about that, and uh, Bobby Jindal was, you know, was very supportive of this uh, sort of teacher's choice, you can do evolution or not, rule. And um, it, at the time, he was under consideration for potentially being Mitt Romney's running mate, and so that was sort of a way to talk about evolution uh, in a slaty way to make people mad and mad at a specific politician. So that's very effective for us. 
So one thing I wanted to, um, to, to kind of say about narrative is that you know, one of the hard things when you're trying to figure out how to tell a story, um, well, you should say, okay, it's hard to know how to tell a story. And the way to know how to tell a story is to just report the bejesus out of it. And one thing I'm seeing, I just moved from Smithsonian to Slate, and uh, a lot of the pitches I get are a little naive. Um, people are reacting to the news, so they've got a, you know, just a quick idea, which is good. You want to be fast for online journalism. Um, but what really sets good writers apart from bad ones is how well they know their subject. And that's where you find your narratives, is you basically just have to know everything there is to know about it. You need to know what other magazines have published, what other scientists have said, even you know, what the back history is what people are fighting about, who the main characters are, and that's really where you will find your narratives and where you find your narratives that stand out. Um, and then once you, once you get to that point, basically you have to know everything there is to know, and so you're holding in your mind this ridiculous you know, amount of knowledge. And again, you want to write this for multiple places. You don't you want to do all that much background just for a quick online story turnaround. Um, but then you have to write it as if you're writing for somebody who knows absolutely nothing about the subject. So you have to have these like two different minds in your mind. You need to have to be the, the expert and the complete ignoramus about it. And it's it's sort of like playing chess with yourself. You have to have these completely different points of view and, and kind of make them wrestle with each other as you're writing. So that's um, a bit of advice I think tends to get overlooked when you're really focusing on narrative is that you can't do it if you don't know everything. And, and a lot of times the narrative will emerge in ways that you've never expected as you're doing the reporting. Um, so finally, there you know, the, this is, you've gotten an incredible you know, data dump on how to write and report here. Um, but I would encourage anybody who's not that you should join the National Association of Science Writers, NASW. Um, and they've just got great resources for science writers. And then there's another one, uh, another relatively new website called The Open Notebook that does in depth interviews with people who've just written knockout narratives, science narratives specifically. And it, it, it really, the, the open notebook is, okay, open up your notebook, tell us how you did it. And uh, so they have just excellent advice about the logistics of writing great narratives. So I would encourage you to look at both of those resources. I'm Mark Rotella, and Scott, you started this. Um, I work for Publishers Weekly magazine, and although we are not 145 years old, like the Atlantic, or uh, we are 130 some odd years old. Uh, we're the first uh, book review uh, organ, um, and we are pretty much the uh, record of uh, book reviews in the book publishing world. So um, I, I'm going to keep mine a little bit short because um, uh, the, you, you can ask me questions about books that you want to have published. Um, but usually after you've uh, been published in Slate, National Geographic, uh, Harper's, and The Atlantic, uh, then you may at one point want to uh, consider a book, uh, one of your articles. You thought, wow, this, this is a good article, but I could turn this into a book. Um, we, we, we published, there's a, a, in the magazine, there's five, six book review editors. Uh, each of us handles about... Um, 15 to 20 books a week. So you, you can do the math. There's quite a bit of books uh, out there being covered. Um, and for me, one of the um, really interesting things is, is uh, uh, I, I, mean, I, I really see a lot of the science books that come through. I mean, I don't write science. I write books on music, um, uh, travel, food, culture, things that have a kind of um, easy narrative or um, a more obvious narrative, and it's, it's the science writers, and I have many good friends who are science writers, and some of the best science writers, and I'm really amazed at how they're able to put a narrative on seemingly complex um, themes and, and subjects, and, and how, how well they're able to remove the jargon and, and make science accessible to the general reader. Um, and one of the things I do in Publishers Week, I mean, we kind of all do there, is we, we look throughout the year, see what kinds of trends in books. So, um, you know, uh, um, you know, we, there's there's the, you know one of the big bigger trends in books in the last year is as um, science meets psychology, the science of the mind, uh, books on anxiety, how how your mind reacts to anxiety, um, Alzheimer's, um, books on you know Prozac, neuroscience. Um, I, I particularly like books that combine 
science, psychology, economics, like last year's Thinking Fast and Slow. I mean, there's just a lot of wonderful books coming out there. And um, I'm amazed, you know, we see books three, four months before they're published. And these are books that have been, you know, people have worked on for one, two, three, four, five more years. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a labor of love often. Uh, I mean, and people just dedicate lives to, this, you know, to their lives to these books. And, you know, as I see books being published, I, I, I sometimes see books that I, I think, this is going to really hit. This is amazing. And then I hear nothing. And then I see books that, that like, what is this? This is just complete garbage. And it just rises. And you can never tell what's going on. There's always really pleasant surprises. But what I think amazes me, and especially when, with, with, with science writing, is how, when it's really, really good, I, how it affects audiences that may not have, uh, uh, the writer may not have thought it would um, influence. And so, yes, in addition to a former ballet dancer, I'm also a hockey dad. And as much as I hate the term, because I spend, you know, I realize because I spend four days a week at the rink with my son, two days I play, uh, I am at the rink a lot. And uh, there's, there's, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time with other hockey dads and moms. And, there's, there's, it's funny, there's one book that I would have never thought would be on the tips of tongues of every hockey parent, and this is Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, Gladwell's uh, Outliers. And, uh, for, and, and this, it's, it's funny how maybe one, one chapter or two chapters can, can convince people who may not ordinarily pick up a book on this. There's a, a chapter on hockey, um, it's really uh, on statistics. It's how he made statistics accessible. Uh, accessible. And it's on how... Um, uh, birth month, birth order, uh, birth month of the year dictates, or at least uh, shows statistically, the chances of this child uh, being a professional hockey player. Uh, and so they say, because um, uh, in hockey, the birth month is, 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 the, uh, December, is, the, is the beginning of the year, January, and like the school month. So uh, kids who are uh, born the beginning of the year, January, uh, are the older ones, and so they're competing against other kids who are going to be younger than them. They're going to be physically grow and advance uh, quicker than, say, someone born in November, like my son. And uh, when, when people say, so, uh, what month are you born? And you're like, January. You're like, all right, that's great. And you say, well, so when's yours? It's like uh, November 25th. You're like, oh. So you're going to be doing a lot of the summer hockey, right, just to keep them up. Yeah. But what I've noticed is that the influence from this book is even bigger in that I've, I've seen um, uh, <laughs> experienced parents who have planned um, uh, to have their kids born at the beginning of the year. Successfully, for the most part, until they realize, oh, well, that was my daughter who was born in January. Um, and I even have uh, 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 parents who I know who've, who've had a uh, planned delivery uh, try and get the doctor to eke it out just one more year so that last week of December becomes the first week of January. When it is funny in actuality, uh, where I live in North Jersey, the, the statistics of any of those kids playing hockey professionals very slim. Um, <laughs> But still, there's hope. Um, so while I, I, you know, we usually have a staff of people who write, um, and, and it's basically because it's of the book publishing world, we, we have people who know about books, who can write about trends in books. But um, occasionally we do take, um, we do consider uh, book reviewers uh, who review science books. So, um, and this is often the chance for people to um, kind of, get their feet wet and, and trying to review books, people who are knowledgeable in the field, uh, to see what it's like to, to, to take a stab at you know, trade writing. So anyway, good luck to you all. <laughs> well, thanks so much to, um, where are you going, Mark? <laughs> well, we know where he's going, so. Uh, Hockey. Hockey, yes. <laughs> Thanks so much to our editors, and um, actually, it's a nice segue to something else I wanted to do before we kind of open this up for questions. Um, uh, Atlantic, National Geographic, Harper, Slate, um, we're talking big time, and, um, and sometimes um, 
and sometimes writers have a difficult time getting into the big time, lots of times not because they're not terrific writers, but maybe they don't have the background and the experience necessary to make the connection or, 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 or okay, make the grade in, in many different respects. But there are always some, there are always terrific, wonderful publications uh, looking for great narrative and great writers. Um, um, work that, that published work as good as, in many respects, um, th these great magazines. There's a couple of editors in the audience, I just, since we're going to be having a, a wine and cheese reception, um, and I encourage you to kind of think about looking those folks uh, up. Um, Ellen Ficklin is here. Um, Ellen Ficklin is the editor of Narrative Matters, uh, which is a, published in a journal, Health Affairs, but uh, is it four times a year? Monthly, monthly opportunities to write in-depth narrative about uh, about healthcare issues and problems, policy and challenges, and so Ellen is here, and um, and she'll be happy to chat with you, I'm sure. And Kevin Finneran, uh, who is the editor right over there in the corner of Issues in Science and Technology, which is published by the National Academy of Sciences, and uh, it's a journal, uh, but. Because of this program, uh, beginning in 2010, Kevin decided that um, he was going to take a chance and do uh, something really different for uh, an academic journal and publish narrative. And he's published a number of the people who have been part of our program. And my guess is that he would certainly be open to uh, narrative ideas about science policy also uh, to talk with you. And also, I wanted to mention uh, my own magazine. I wanted to hold it up because I'm the person who's a moderator here, and I can do that. Um, <laughs> creative nonfiction. Um, and Hattie Fletcher is here. I hope there, right there, the managing editor of Creative Nonfiction. And um, obviously, Creative Nonfiction is quite interested in narrative, and Hattie would be happy to talk with you um, as well. Creative Nonfiction is only 18 years old. But, um, but, um, but it's amazing to have a nonprofit magazine that even lives in this day and age for 18 years. So that's really good. And I just wanted, this is kind of an in-person to introduce, but none of us would ever be here, and none of us would be sitting here tonight, and I wouldn't be standing here holding up this magazine if it wasn't for um, the, the, the CISPO research associate and my assistant who's written all these millions of emails to everyone involved, Michael Zorelnik, who's over there. Um, so finally, um, um, uh, I wanted to, uh, the rest of this time together, you'll get a chance to answer, ask some questions, but I, I also wanted to begin uh, this conversation with kind of a, a, a lynch or a link between the editors um, and, and the readers, and that's the writer. Um, Virginia Morrell uh, has worked closely, um, um, I gather, with Victoria for a while, and certainly um, for National Geographic for a long time. As I mentioned to you, she's written for lots of terrific magazines, including Condé Nast Traveler and Science. Oh, and Laura, oh, and, and at Smithsonian, oh my goodness. So. Um, well, have you worked for anybody else at this table? Um, well, actually, um, she's also, this is really so cool about some writers. Um, she's written for creative nonfiction, and creative nonfiction doesn't pay, we pay almost as much as The Atlantic or Harper's, but not quite. Um, so, so um, and I thought Virginia might say a word about working with editors or pitching with editors. And so we'll make this trans. We'll make this transition, um, if, if you will, Virginia, to just, I promised you I would say something. I would get you to connect. So if you don't want to, it's okay. But if, um, Okay, it just, just for a little while, and then we'll open it up to, uh, I'll, I might ask a question or two, but we'll open it up for questions uh, for the rest of the time. So, um, so Virginia Morrell, and then, um, and then we'll see what happens. Thanks, Lee. I don't have any prepared remarks because that was sort of an off-the-cuff invitation, but um, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> but uh, so I'm not exactly sure what to say, except that in my experience, I mean, I've, and I've been asked this by writers starting out, you know, how do you approach editors and so forth, and I find that you, in time, if you're 
as you uh, say pitch an editor and they like your idea and you work with them on something, they're generally really good-hearted people and they want you to write for them again. And uh, I've never found it to be um, sort of an off-putting sort of relationship. Instead, it's sort of a collaborative uh, relationship and uh, in that way it can be an awful lot of fun. I have a, a good time working with Laura on a fun story about humpback whales at Smithsonian and I, I don't think I did the Brian Hare profile with you, but so maybe you worked on Susan Solomon a bit? Yeah, that one. Uh, and uh, with Victoria Pope, I worked on a story about animal minds, which then led to this book that I've just finished on the subject. And what I found in uh, pitching ideas, I think that's the thing that most writers here probably want to know about. And, and I, what I was always told when I was starting out as a writer was simply to write a pitch that uh, you could write that filled up basically no more than a page because editors didn't like to turn pages. <laughs> so I was told uh, they're nodding their heads. See? <laughs> and, and the other thing that I've, I've always found about editors, and I mean, I married an editor. I married Michael McRae, who was, um, was a senior editor at Outside Magazine. And, Editors uh, have a little bit of the worry gene in them. And so one expression that you hear constantly, I even hear it in my own home now, is I worry about X. <laughs> and and uh, they worry about, you know, has, how's this story been covered in the past, or how you're going to go out and report it. And there are many, many worries that uh, never occur to the writer who always arrives very optimistic and gung-ho <laughs> and thinks, you know, that the story you've brought them is, you, you should just do it, you know? Don't worry, we'll do it. <laughs> so those are some of my observations on the writer-editor relationship. But mostly I find that it, it's um, been very rewarding. Speaking of Virginia and her books, and uh, and Scott and Mark, um, there will be books for sale, um, uh, their books, um, outside. So um, uh, during the reception, you can take a look at those books. Let me uh, let me ask um, one question to all the editors. I'll ask just one or two, and then I'll open it up to you for the last half hour. But um, we're talking about working with writers, and we're talking about writers here who may not be incredibly experienced. And my, I, um, I said I didn't think that Harper's in the Atlantic would, and the National Geographic and, and Slate would jump to, to, um, uh, to work with um, um, inexperienced or unpublished or semi-unpublished writers. How, what, what about first-time publisher or new writers? How, um, um, how, how, how do we crack into uh, your world or is it not possible? Uh, I would say, though, know, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, you know, it's very important to me. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, I'll get it closer. Uh, it's very hard to hire someone to do a long form narrative piece unless you know something about their writing, um, what they've done before. It just, it, and it's not to say that you wouldn't be interested if, if somebody has clips and they're really good. You, yes, you could be interested in an un unknown, as it were. But um, I found that there have been people who have, who have worked their way into, um, into the feature world just by being interested in doing short pieces, um, either in the front of the magazine, which we call departments, and in, um, in a digital media. So, uh, and people who, people who are good, it, it just, you know, it, it rises to the top, people notice it, and, and things can happen. They may not happen overnight, but they do happen. So, yes, there are cases where I've seen that, seen that, seen that happen. Yeah, I mean, you're asking editors to take a multi-thousand dollar bet on you. Um, and the more assurances you can provide that editor that you're going to be able to pay off, that that bet is going to pay off, the better. And that's what clips are. I mean, that's what um, both short and longer clips are. Um, but I've had the chance of uh, working with a few writers on long form pieces where it was their first long form piece. Um, and it is, a, I mean, it's a fun experience to sort of take a writer through that for the first time. 
and uh, I think that there are some of those slots available. Um, last year I worked on a case with a writer who wrote for the Financial Times, so the longest thing he'd ever written in his life, at least for publication, was about 1,200 words, and we ended up publishing his piece at, I think, a little bit over 9,000 words, so it was, it was a big jump, um, but he did it. I mean, it, it's possible, but it, it's, you know, that's three or four pieces a year in Harvard that, that maybe qualify for that. Yeah, and that, I, would, I would say it, it, it is rare, but, but not uh, un, unheard of at all. I mean, just uh, one example that springs to mind, uh, William Longbeach has actually now moved on from the Atlantic to Vanity Fair. But back, this was probably way back in the early 90s, he was, uh, of all things, a commercial pilot. Uh, he had done some writing, but only for uh, trade aviation publications. And he had gone on a trip to, uh, he was flying around um, the Sahara, and he sent over the transom, didn't know anybody, uh, a typewritten pitch about this. And there was something, uh, you, know, you could just see that he had uh, the, the, the eye and the voice um, and, and the kind of writerly chops to be able to try something. And, so, so we published that, it was his first story, it became a cover story, his second piece was a cover story, and he went on to basically you know, reinvent his career as a long-form narrative writer. So, so it, it absolutely does happen. I mean, for us, you know, we're always in the position of having to decide, um, you know, we're making an investment, and if somebody has a long clip file of uh, demonstrated success of doing these kinds of pieces, we feel somewhat more comfortable. Often what we will do at The Atlantic is, um, you know, always hoping that we're betting with the writer, but we'll change our terms and say, look, we've never done this before, this is a big risk for us, we're a business, we're worried about losing lots of money. How would you feel do it, about doing it for, you know, less money than your uh, more experienced peer would be uh, paid? And yet, you know, if it pays off, you end up with a very prominent piece that you can then leverage into, uh, that becomes a clip you can take. Elsewhere, so 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 it, 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 it does happen. It, it's it's rare, um, you know. And, and then we get you know, a ton of sure as uh, you all do. You know, many of many pitches into the slush pile, in fact, and the, and the yield rate from there is incredibly small, but not again. Um, it's not a zero percent uh, return rate. So. so you want to start with me um, because I publish people who haven't published much, pretty much every week. Um, and that's new writers, uh, writers who are just finishing up a, a, a journalism program, and scholars, scientists, um, historians, all the time. I will run stories for people who don't have great experience in magazine writing. Um, so and that's, that's a function of I'm not limited by pages. I can you know, run as many stories as I can process. So uh, it, for me, it's, it's no problem at all if somebody doesn't have a lot of books. So. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, by, by clips, especially for long form, um, if they have the, the clips also ought to be long form as well, not just short pieces, as that's as demonstrated. You know, I think so. It's interesting for me um, because I had worked as a foreign correspondent for most of my career, and when I got to National Geographic, I thought about many different really good people I've worked with from prominent newspapers, and I. I was surprised in some, in some, in many cases actually, when I asked them to do long form pieces on countries that they knew a lot about, it was, it was very, very hard for them. And some picked it up and, and some did not. It's, it is different and, and it, you know, it has been, if you haven't learned it, and some people have the knack for it, some people, because you're often learning how to compress, compress, compress as a, as a correspondent, try to get anything into 750 words. It's very hard to loosen up in that respect and know how to ventilate it a little bit. Yeah, I would second that, that strongly, that, that there are people who you would think you know, they've been beat correspondents for the most prominent daily newspaper, whether it's New York Times, Washington Post, um, and you would think, and they have just you know, deep, deep expertise, deep range of contacts. Um, and, and somehow there's just it's, 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 it's a different skill set and a different sensibility that it takes to um, uh, translate that. And then and then other times there are people who are able who, 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 who have much less experience, and you can see even based on shorter clips that they have. And a lot of it comes down to voice for long form thing. Yeah. I mean, voice is a sort of shorthand, squishy term, 
But you want somebody, um, particularly with the science piece, I mean, somebody, I, I can't remember in this panel or other stuff, we were talking about Olivia Jensen. I mean, the, the, there are writers who, um, and, 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 and voices partly in here in just the, literally the, 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 the quality of the prose, but how their personality comes across and the authority that they convey. You know, you, you're in the hands of, we keep referring to this sort of um, metaphor of, of, of having your Virgil take you, um, you know, into the uh, whatever the terrain is, and there are certain people who just have the knack um, for uh, for doing that. You know, can manage to project that they have this authority, and you are immediately you immediately sort of like them. They have to be likable in a way, um, and then and then they obviously have to be excellent reporters and and and, and uh, clear. And it's uh, again, you know it when you see it. But it's, it's, it's a fairly rare gift, but it can be cultivated too. Well, I think that's the problem with short clips for trying to get a longer piece of sign is that most places, and I think Slate is, is, the, is the exception, if you're writing something short, it means those voices can be stripped out of it to some extent. Like most of the shorter pieces in uh, commercial magazines, they just, they're not interested in voice there. They want the information. So it doesn't tell you enough as an editor. So when you're talking about clips, are you including uh, blogs? It, it can be. I, mean, I feel like you can get a sense, and, and cover letters too. I mean, it sounds silly, um, and, and, I, and we probably make wrong judgments based on this sometimes, but often you'll get a cut. I, 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 I'm always looking for, can you tell the quality of the person's thinking, and do they have an interesting mind? Now, sometimes you have people with interesting minds who are absolutely in, uh, in, unable to put together a long piece just because they know the structural skills, um, which is kind of a different set. But, but, can often tell from the pitch itself, you know, how much command of the material do they have, how interesting are they going to be. So, so, and, and that applies to short form stuff too. Um, sometimes you're unpleasantly surprised. You think this person has great command of the material, great voice, knows what they're talking about, and then somehow, um, the, 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 when you're looking at something that's longer than three, four, five, six thousand words, it just doesn't somehow fit together. And sometimes that, that's where if the raw material is good enough, that's where we as editors earn our pay. Um, Put so, together. Suppose you just work it because of the specialness of that person's um, experience and have done something unique. I uh, signed a, a poet who had um, had actually also been stationed in, in Iraq. He had, he had blogged about it for the New York Times and he wanted to, and he had not been back in Baghdad for 18 months and we asked him to go and, and, and see what he, and to write about what he saw. and. You know, to be honest, his first draft was a little constrained, but it was. But he really, he felt it. He knew it. It was. I, I wanted somebody who had the special kind of experience of, of having been a GI there. I wanted him to be reflecting on that role, and and um, so despite the fact that he'd never done long form in the end, it, it turned out very well because he brought some special things to the to the story. Do you have preferences? Do we um, should we write you a letter um, on paper? Should we send you an email at, uh, with a with a pitch? Should we send you an email and asking you if we can send you a pitch? What um, what's what's and, and besides which, um, yesterday Michael Rosenwald, who was um, who who is a reporter for the Washington Post and also um, a freelance writer, talked about um, how many hours he has to put in searching for your secret emails so that he can even, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so what's, what's, how, what do we do here? We're, how do we do this? I, you know, I, I get a lot of thoughts, but I get a lot of emails, and what's, what's best is a short description of what you about yourself, so that I can, in my case, I, I have different editors. Once I know a little bit about the story, then I'm going to pass it on to the editor. I think it's a better position to, to go further with the idea. And I don't need to have everything. But if you send everything, it's okay too, because it's easy to call you guys. But I think, you know, something to us is good. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, having, I mean, in, in the old days, we would use, partly because we use in the pre internet, pre email era, and then we sort of carried this over just to prevent the sort of massive inundation of. of of endless pitches, we would try to encourage people to send things by snail mail just to make them jump through more hoops. Uh, <laughs> you know, because otherwise, you get people sort of sending yeah. you 
half-baked ideas all the time. But, but, the, but that said, I, I, and this is maybe a personal preference, I like to have something uh, by email, and I'll have writers, uh, and unless it's someone who I've, I've worked with a lot, um, and, and, and writers who I know a lot, I'm happy to have them call me up, and then we can, you know, I certain they know what I want, I know what they're good at, and we can talk it through. If you're, if you're, if you're a writer that I don't know very well, you can call me, but I'm going to say, put it in writing. And part of that's a, it's, it's almost like an internal bureaucracy thing, because if I don't have something in writing that I can then take to my colleagues in order to, to sell to them, it's not, it's not much good. And you're going to be able to put it in, 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 in a more succinctly or, or, or you know, with more detail than, than, than I could. So there's no harm in sending what you've got. And then you know, sometimes the reaction will be, you know, there's nothing here. Sometimes it will be, this is great, go ahead. Most often it will be, I don't know, I'm going to send it to some colleagues, we're going to talk about it some more, and maybe we'll get back to you with uh, a request for more information. Well, I'll just tell you one of my more interesting assignments Actually, uh, when I went to the, the first CNF conference I attended, which was in 2008, it was the conference in um, Oxford, Mississippi. Oxford, Mississippi. And um, Ted Moncrief, who was then with the Coming Nuts Traveler magazine, was at that conference. He, he and I were seated next to each other on a panel, and Ted was the executive editor of the Coming Nuts Traveler. He turned to me at one point and he said, he asked me, Chief, do you know what the word biophony means? I said, well, it must be something about natural sounds. He said, you'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I need a writer <laughs> to write about natural sounds. <laughs> it's a subject you really want to cover. And would you do it for us? I said, so, well, sure. You know, I didn't zip about it, but I mean, it was, I didn't write a lot about biology, so I could put bio and phony together. <laughs> so you just never know. <laughs> and that turned out to be a very, very fun and um, it, was, it turned out to be a good story and very popular with the readers as, as well. And actually one practical tip, I mean this, may, uh, having worked as both an editor and somebody who pitches freelance stuff, I mean I often get um, kind of frustrated because people send me stuff and then they don't hear and they don't know and then I never hear from them again, and they think I've blown them off, or I haven't read it. And, um, you know, we, we are often so inundated with, with you know, multiple pitches and just the uh, challenges of putting out the magazine. Um, oftentimes, sometimes no response means no, but it's usually that's, if, if we don't respond, that's where we, we should respond. Um, more often, no response means we really haven't gotten to it yet. And you shouldn't feel shy after a respectful period of time um, of pinging us again um, politely and saying, oh, have you gotten to this yet? And often the kids will be, oh, no, I'm so embarrassed. It's, it's near the top of my queue. I've just been dealing with 18 other things. Or I have brought it up, and it's, we're waiting for the next editorial meeting. Um, so there's, and there's a, a balance uh, uh, for freelancers that you have to strike between um, making sure you're not letting your stuff get forgotten, ping us again, without being you know, absolutely harassing us. Because sometimes you no know, response means no, but, 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 but really we should be telling you no. But it's true, and I think being uh, thick-skinned is really important, and, it, and, and, and when you're thick-skinned, I think it's easier to just go ahead and send out a message and, you know, frame it in a way that makes it possible for someone to write you back a quick answer. But um, I think that really works better. Yeah, and, and you want to think of the... You know, especially the initial pitch as the beginning of conversation. A lot of times uh, an editor will come back and say, at this angle we've done, this angle you know, doesn't work for us, but tell me more about that. And so you want to you know, very promptly reply. And, you know, it can be very informal, but uh, you know, expect to go through a series of emails before a story gets accepted. Um, and also, I, I think I mentioned before, the open notebook. Um, I did a story for them I, I, last year, I guess, where I talked to, I, I, it's organized a, a roundtable discussion via email with editors from Wire, New York Times, Science, National Geographic Online, and Times of America. It's called How Not to Pitch. And it is the mistakes that we see over and over again. Um, and read that and you'll know what not to do. And then you'll avoid irritating editors. It's very practical advice. Uh, um, Virginia brings up something that I think that's really interesting and important. Here she is, um, a, a well-established writer um, who has published um, 
uh, books and many, many articles, yet she went to a conference and was able to find an editor and I think a new agent at that conference as well. Um,